So um, welcome to this evening's discussion, Marijuana and Youth, a Community Conversation. Um, tonight's um, program is hosted, co-hosted by 21 Reasons and the City of Portland Public Health Division. Thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Joe Morrissey. I'm the program manager for 21 Reasons. So as you know, Colorado and Washington voters approved their legalization member measures in November 2012. And Colorado stores began selling marijuana legally on January 1st, 2014. The state of Washington is expected to start this June. Alaskans are expected to vote on a measure this August. Closer to home, the Maine legislature narrowly defeated a legalization measure this spring of 2013 and voted not to take one up in this current session. But, however, Representative Diane Russell and at least two national pro-marijuana groups have pledged to bring it, uh, another bill back, if not in 2015, then again in 2016. And even closer to home here in Portland, voters in Maine's largest city, Portland, passed an ordinance making possession of up to two and a half ounces in certain circumstances legal. And of course, there is Maine's medical marijuana program. And I'm Shonda Sinclair from um, City of Portland Public Health Division, Substance Abuse Prevention Program. And amid this debate is all of us, parents, youth, caregivers, um, youth advocates, and concerned citizens. Um, and how do we as a community come together to make sure that marijuana doesn't become more readily available, promoted to, and used by more youth in the future? Tonight we hope to clear the air about how marijuana works and how it affects the the body and brain, particularly those of the youth developing brain. Um, and we like, we're also going to take a look at how marijuana is being marketed in other states as well as on the internet and discuss how we can avoid inadvertently sending our youth information, misinformation about the glamor glamorization of marijuana. Sorry. We have assembled a panel um, from hearing from the community, we've assembled a panel of people on all sides so that we can have a good open discussion about this issue. Um, their views are their own and not necessarily those of 21 Reasons in the City of Portland. Um, public health, the information shared here tonight is intended to deepen the discussion on marijuana. So before we hand this over to tonight's moderator, Shannon Moss, a little bit of housekeeping for you all. This evening's program is being recorded by CTN 5 and will be available for rebroadcast on their station. Please help us produce a quality tape by please turning off all sounds on your cell phones or smartphones or dumb phones or iPads or whatever you have. Um, the Portland Public Library, um, the space does have free Wi-Fi if you haven't already tapped into it and you need to. Um, emergency exits are located um, both to your left, which goes out into the library, and as well as behind you and to your right, those um, bottom out, out into the street, should you find yourself needing them. Um, bathrooms are located outside this door and to the right. Smoking is prohibited in the Rhines Auditorium or any other space in the public library at all times. We will be taking questions from the audience in two formats. Them as you've filed in, hopefully you've seen on your seat um, a, a little index card and a pen, so we'll be going around and collecting any questions that you may have. Or we would also love to hear from you, and we have a, a microphone set up here up front. We ask that if there's um, an approach to the microphone, you take it on the outside of the pillars here. Again, um, help us produce that quality tape for reproduction. Um, and now, oh, and then one more thing. On your seats also, you found some feedback forms um, around this evening's program. We would love to hear from you around um, how you think the program went, what other programming that you may want to have, or, or any feedback that you think would be valuable to us and or our panelists here this evening. So, and before I turn this over to tonight's mo moderator, Shannon Moss. Shannon Moss um, has just started a new fascinating um, chapter in her life. You can check out Split Screen on ShannonMoss.com where she covers stories from the Downies Magazine. And you can also hear her on Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 on WLOB Talk Show. And again, Shannon Moss. Thank you and welcome everyone. It's great to see you here this evening. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. 
Never met a mic I didn't like. Well, so the boy, that was convenient. <laughs> I looked right at you when I said that too, right? <laughs> didn't, although I do like you, Mike. All right, well, hi and welcome, everyone. I'll be mo your moderator for this evening, and tonight's program is going to go a bit like this. In just a moment, we're going to give each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. They have been provided, or I've been provided, with some questions to ask each panelist. Um, or have questions directed towards individual panelists as well. Now again, as Joe was saying, this is not a debate. It's not meant to be whether marijuana should be legal or not. That's not why we're here tonight. That's not the conversation. Tonight is about discussing how we shape our community so that marijuana is not marketed or made easily available to our youth. And now I'd like for each of the panelists to tell us not only their name, but their affiliation, and briefly tell us your position on marijuana. We have a packed program, a lot of opportunity for a lot of questions, as well as from the audience as well, if you have some. So we want to get started. And if you could keep your introductions about a minute or so, that would be great. And we'll start off with you, Portland Police Chief Mike Sauschuk. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Uh, I appreciate that. Mike Sostruck, uh, the chief of the Portland Police Department. I've been in Portland for about 17 years, been the chief for about uh, three years. Uh, we've certainly uh, been involved in the conversation around uh, marijuana, primarily through uh, the city ordinance uh, that was passed uh, recently. Um, and I look forward to answer any questions and to take part uh, in this healthy debate here tonight. Uh, I truly look forward to it. Uh, we start talking about youth, which is why we're here. I think we can speak in, uh, with one voice around our concerns uh, around availability to, uh, to youth, and that's certainly why I'm here tonight. So thanks. Thank you, Mike. Mike Freisinger? Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Freisinger, and I am the program director for the Maine Youth Court, which is a youth-run diversion program based in restorative justice philosophy. Um, and I'm here tonight because I would love to be a part of the conversation of helping the system move away from a punitive response um, to substance abuse towards one that addresses treatment and supporting youth in recovery. Thank you, Mike. Oh, sorry. Grania Dunn? <laughs> yeah, my name is Grania Dunn, and I'm an organizer with the uh, main affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union, um, and I'm focused specifically on criminal justice reform. Um, the ACLU, both the national ACLU and the main affiliate, um, are supportive of legalization, both um, at the national level, at the state level, and we worked on the Portland Ordinance as well. As well. Um, our particular interest in this is we see marijuana legalization as a key part in a key piece in reducing um, the, our over-reliance on use of the criminal justice system. We believe that drug use is really a public health issue um, and that we need to stop using our criminal justice system to try and address what really is a public health issue. Ron, if it's easier, you can pull your mic just a little bit closer for you. No, that's okay, just so you don't have to lean all the way over. David Boyer? Hi, my name is Dave Boyer. I'm the main... <laughs> I'm the main political director for the Marijuana Policy Project. Uh, we were one of the primary backers in last year's campaign to make marijuana legal for adults 21 and over. Um, my organization is the largest nonprofit in the country and the world dedicated to uh, changing our failed policies of marijuana prohibition and uh, regulating marijuana in a manner similar to alcohol. Scott Gagnier? Oh, my name is Scott Gagnier. Um, I'm with Sam Main, which is Smart Approaches to Marijuana. We are the main affiliate of Project Sam. Um, co-founded by Kevin Sabet and Patrick Kennedy. We're an organization that is all about uh, bringing the science of today's marijuana into the conversation around marijuana policy. Um, we do not support legalization. However, we also do support taking a serious look at current policies we have and addressing where we can issues of uh, where, where stigma and, and those kinds of things follow people. So we're, we're sort of a third way approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let's get right to the questions because, again, we're limited on time. We want to get through as much as we can. With legalization happening in Washington as well as Colorado on the ballot in many other states, what do you think has been the effects of this movement on the youth perception of risk for smoking and also their use rates? And, Chief, we'll start right with you. The thing, I, I think that uh, in these particular instances where you're legalizing marijuana in a state, uh, I think it continues uh, to confuse our youth. While one state may have it one way, uh, the federal law, state law, medical marijuana, I think there's a lot of different aspects of marijuana uh, legislation that can make this very confusing. And I think in these two particular states, uh, you can picture youth, despite the fact that they may want to say they don't care what adults think, and uh, they're, they're going to look at that and say, well, uh, the adults in this state, the political arms in this state, 
uh, have approved this, um, therefore it must be okay, it must be healthy, it must be safe. Uh, and I think you're naturally going to see uh, additional usage uh, in those particular scenarios. They're going to use that information uh, to back their usage and say, well, if you can do it, then therefore I can as well. David Boyer, do you want to make a comment? Okay. Um, I'm going to mix, up, mix around a little bit. Unless you want to go in order. Is that easier for you guys to go in order? I'll mix it up. Uh, mix it up. Uh, I don't care. David, go for it. Keep you on your toes a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think uh, what's going on in states like Washington and Colorado have really fostered a discussion between, about the relative harms of uh, marijuana and alcohol, which are you know, the two most used substances in our society today. And that's not going to change anytime soon. And I think what it does is reaffirm that uh, marijuana, just like alcohol, is for adults 21 and over. You know, I think it's, it doesn't make sense that the penalties aren't the same for a marijuana drug dealer selling to children, where a liquor store owner uh, selling to a minor has really harsh penalties. So I think if uh, you know, we had those same penalties in place for marijuana and, and a regulation uh, w to go with that, then you would see uh, children's use go down. Mike Freisinger? I would agree with the chief that it has caused significant confusion in my own personal experience in working with youth who've been summoned for um, possession of marijuana. I hear all sorts of kind of crazy things that I think have been influenced by particularly the local referendum in Portland. I remember one young man in particular saying, well, it's legal now. And I had to say to him, well, A, you don't live in Portland, you are from another community, and B, you're 16. So uh, the referendum actually has no impact on the legality of your use. Um, and so I would agree that there's some misinformation and confusion out there that does make it difficult to deal with in a really purposeful way. Grania? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that our organization can really speak to perceptions of harm around youth. Um, so I'm, that's not something I feel like I can essentially really address. I think what we saw with the current laws around criminalization of marijuana is they're not necessarily effective in discouraging uh, youth drug use either. Um, so I think a lot remains to be seen about watching what kind of happens in Washington and Colorado. Um, but I think what we all can agree on is that what criminalization, or maybe we can't all agree on that, but criminalization isn't necessary, isn't an effective response to uh, decreasing youth drug use, uh, youth marijuana use rates. Scott? Um, I think it clearly has impacted our perceptions of risk, and not just Washington and Colorado, and not just the Portland ordinance, but even our own medical marijuana program in Maine. I think it's no accident that uh, the percentage of, of students who believe there's no risk or only a slight risk of using marijuana has started increasing since 2009 when the Maine medical marijuana program came online. So I think even that program itself is sending some confused messages to our youth. Um, and when we, in terms of use rates, um, you know, most of our other substances are trending down and marijuana is the only one that's remaining flat. So I think that's, that's an indicator that there's something going on and I, I think certainly the campaigns in Washington, Colorado, the ones that are going on here in Maine across the country are contributing to that. I think Mike's, uh, Mike Soschuk's the best one to answer this next question. You talk, all of you are talking about there is some confusion going on. So let's put it clear, for, especially for our youth who is watching or will be watching this. Is it legal now to buy, sell, and use marijuana in the city of Portland, Chief? I wish I could say it would even be clear once I say it, but uh, there would be others, <laughs> I think, that would, that would uh, state otherwise, probably. But uh, in, uh, in the city of Portland, no, it is not legal uh, currently to possess, uh, sell, uh, or use uh, marijuana. And uh, I'll simply just state that uh, in the, the state of Maine, uh, we'll just focus on Maine. The preemption laws are in full effect and have been for a long time. It's a basic legal principle uh, that says federal law preempts uh, state law, which preempts uh, local ordinances. Uh, and I think there's some simple reasons for that. Uh, the state of Maine doesn't want uh, the city of Portland to essentially do whatever it wants. Uh, we could say uh, preemption doesn't exist. So uh, something that I would love to see happen is the city of Portland have the opportunity uh, to make its own firearms regulations. Uh, what works for us doesn't necessarily work for a small town in Franklin County where I grew up. Well, you can't do that under state law. There's one state law that, that regulates that. Um, and therefore, when we have the ordinance, which was passed by a, a, a majority of uh, Portland residents, um, that's what made that tricky, the, the conversation around the fact that just because we pass that doesn't mean, in fact, it preempts state law. 
Uh, so no, it is not legal uh, in the city of Portland, uh, in my eyes as the chief of the Portland Police Department, um, to use, possess, uh, or uh, sell uh, marijuana. Rania? Yeah, so we've, we've talked about this extensively before. Um, it, Maine has quite, has, has the authority and the autonomy to uh, use its resources how it sees fit. Um, and that exists also for the Portland police. They can pri prioritize certain things over other things. They choose um, to prioritize enforcing certain laws over, for example, enforcing jaywalking laws. And um, so we really hope that what the Portland voters overwhelmingly um, sent a message to the Portland police and city officials that they want adults to not be penalized um, for possessing marijuana, for possessing 2.5 ounces of marijuana within the city. David, do you have a comment? Does anyone else want to chime in here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, the chief said that the state can't go against federal law, and yet we have a medical marijuana program which is 100% out of compliance with federal law, and that's okay. Voters approved it, and uh, you know, the administration, the government in, in Maine hasn't done anything uh, against that. Even though the federal government could come and raid dispensaries any day they wanted to now. Um, and, you know, voters approved uh, overwhelmingly that Portland should change its ordinance to say that adults should be able to possess marijuana. Um, there is no requirement that the police in Portland uh, enforce the state law. They're allowed to. They can cite it, and they have since the ordinance passed, but there's no requirement. Just like there's no requirement for police to pull people over that go five miles over the speed limit or, or jaywalk. They know it's not worth their time and energy or the taxpayers' time uh, and money. So uh, voters approved in November that police should treat adults possessing small amounts of marijuana like people jaywalking or not wearing a seatbelt. Scott? Um, I'm certainly not going to speak to, I mean, I think the chief covered what what's legal in Portland better than I certainly can as someone who doesn't live in Portland. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, from our perspective, I mean, I think he's, he's covered well the, the preemption issues. And, you know, really, I think, in a certain sense, the, the, what happened in the city of Portland is a symbolic victory. It's, it's, it's a symbol of, of, of trying to advance, you know, uh, an initiative across the state. So, I mean, and, you know, I think it, it harkens back to the earlier question, and then in one of the the side effects of this is it does send very confusing signals to um, to our youth, which which Mike uh, you know kind of illuminated earlier. So um, you know I think it, there's, there's a lot of confusion, but you know, but that's that's what I have to say. Okay, Mike Feisinger, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, I think that the refer referendum is very symbolic, but um, I think that the confusion that exists in the differing op uh, opinions that we see even amongst this small panel really highlights the need for um, clearer um, regulation and a more unified approach to marijuana use that comes down from top leadership so that we can be, um, uh, particularly with regards to uh, youth marijuana use, being able to present on a unified front. All right, our next question. There have been many assertions that marijuana is safer than alcohol. What evidence do you know of which supports or contradicts this for youth? David? Well, um, the World Health Organization, National Institute on Drug Abuse, and even our president recently said that marijuana is safer than alcohol. Um, you know, look at the science. Marijuana is less addictive than alcohol. It's less toxic, less harmful. It, it doesn't lead to violent or belligerent behavior. Uh, so, the science is clear. I don't think anybody on this panel would, would dispute that. Chief? I guess I would say I am not a scientist, uh, nor am I a, a medical doctor. Well, what I will say is that if we start drawing a comparison between alcohol and cigarettes and anything, that's an incredibly low bar for us to work on. Is it safer than alcohol? That's not saying a whole lot uh, that it's safer than alcohol. Uh, is it, is it uh, the impacts of uh, the social costs of alcohol and tobacco versus marijuana? Uh, that is an incredibly low bar for us to look at. Uh, the impacts of what we deal with on a regular basis every single day uh, in the police department in the city of Portland is substance abuse drives crime. Uh, substance abuse overall uh, drives social ills across the board. 
Uh, it's a fact of life. Uh, it's something that uh, I can speak to. Um, and you can talk about uh, that marijuana may not cause an individual to be belligerent in some folks, but the sale of marijuana, on the other hand, uh, causes problems uh, for me, causes problems for the community. Um, and again, I think that's nothing that we would argue here either. Uh, the sale of uh, the trafficking of marijuana uh, and any other drug uh, is certainly problematic. Dave, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with the chief that, you know, having adults purchasing marijuana uh, from drug dealers, from criminals, is exposing people to a criminal element that they otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. If they could go to licensed, regulated businesses to buy marijuana instead of drug dealers, you wouldn't have that violence, you wouldn't have that crime. And it is important to compare marijuana to alcohol because alcohol is legal, if, if, and so is tobacco, but we don't even bother comparing it to tobacco because everyone knows tobacco is really bad for you and causes lots of harm, lots of death. Whereas alcohol, we celebrate alcohol in our society. Uh, we use it at weddings, we toast with it. Um, there's ridiculous commercials on the Super Bowl for alcohol, yet it, it has very bad effects on our society. You know, 40,000 people a year die from alcohol, not including accidents, and you know, that number for marijuana is zero. Um, so our point is, adults can responsibly use alcohol and marijuana, and um, given that marijuana is safer than alcohol, uh, we shouldn't be steering people to drink when there's a safer alternative to relax after a hard days of work. Scott? Oh, Mike. Oh, thought, Mike, I thought you were going to raise your hand there at me. Did you have a comment back or no? <laughs> you, I thought you were raising your hand. You were fixing your cuff and I thought you were raising your hand. Yeah, I, I was raising my hand. I'm not oh. sure the, the format. Well, yeah, sure, that was, a, that was a hand. I think that if we look at alcohol versus marijuana in that conversation, uh, I don't think that uh, in that particular instance uh, that it's okay because we do this for alcohol. Alcohol has failed. It's failed across the board. Uh, so therefore we should do that with marijuana. That's okay. Maybe we fix alcohol a little bit. Fix is a strong word, right? Uh, we try to work with that some more around advertising and access uh, rather than just say, well, okay, if that's okay here, then, then marijuana should be okay. We should allow that to do the same thing. I, I think it's a slippery slope uh, because alcohol is bad news uh, and we know it's the number one drug uh, that is used and abused out there in society. So it, it, to me, again, it kind of goes back to that comparison. Chief, are you, you, really for, draw that comparison? Are you for alcohol prohibition? No, I'm not. Okay. Scott, go ahead. Uh, I think he raises a good point. Uh, alcohol is the number one abused drug, a regulated drug. Uh, regulation has failed in that sense. Um, so do we really want to regulate marijuana like alcohol? Do we want to have those results? Do we want to have more youth using? I don't think so. Um, to me, the, the, this, this comparison is a red herring. Is marijuana a safe drug? No, it is not. Um, it has impacts on IQ. It has impacts on mental health. It has impact on the future and success of youth. It can seriously derail a youth's future. That's a huge impact. That's, it doesn't only impact the individual, it impacts communities, uh, impacts worker productivity. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a deep it's, and lasting impact on, on everybody. That real so, quick, actually, we just got a question from the audience. What about how marijuana affects youth? And I think you sort of just alluded to yeah, that. Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's, like I said, there's the, IQ, there's the study that's shown that there's links to IQ drops. There's the, the studies on the impact on mental health, the, you know, academic success and futures. So I think there's some significant impact. So it's not a safe drug. I mean, this whole alcohol and marijuana comparison is about, it, it, it sends a signal, to, it sends a, mess, a mixed message to youth, I believe, that marijuana is safe. I think we saw it in the bus ads that ran here in Portland. The sort of choose marijuana over alcohol, choose Coke over Pepsi, that's, that's irresponsible messaging that is steering, is implying that marijuana is a safe product. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that comparison is helpful. It's not a safe product. Rania or Mike Reisinger, before we move on, do you want to talk about that? Sure. My organization, we really don't feel that 
we can weigh in on the relative safety of marijuana versus alcohol. Our concerns really are around the use of our criminal justice system to try and um, discourage and deter marijuana use. Um, I think we see that the harms of sending people through our criminal justice system are really terrible. Our marijuana laws, are, we have been, we've, we've been waging a war on drugs for 40 years. Um, we have the largest criminal justice system in the world. Our criminal justice system is vastly unfair, particularly when we look at enforcement of drug laws. Um, when we look at enforcement of marijuana laws nationally, African Americans are three times, over three times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than whites um, here in Maine. That number is over twice as likely. Um, so our concern around this is really around the harms that come with using our criminal justice system to try to address what really is a public health issue. Mike, do you have a follow-up to that? In addressing um, youth marijuana use, and. I agree uh, in large part with the science referenced earlier um, about marijuana use amongst uh, responsible, moderate marijuana use uh, for adults. Um, and I'm not going to try to reference the science about um, marijuana use amongst youth. Instead, I'm going to reference how I've seen it affect the youth that I've worked with personally. Um, and they're really clear and capable of identifying how uh, marijuana use has um, really impacted what we call um, achieving traditional normative adolescent milestones and that's continuing participation in sports and after school clubs and activities, relationships with their friends, um, their <coughs> grades uh, and their connections with their family and in their community and so that's uh, what I've experienced firsthand. I want to get to this next question. According to the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey, a little more than six out of ten high school students report in Portland report easy access to marijuana. Do you think legalizing marijuana will only increase that access to drugs for youth? Scott, do you want to take this question first? I, I think it certainly will, and um, it, it's going to create. And you know, when we we talk about access, there's two forms of access. There's re retail access. So, you know, commonly we we we've, we've heard. Um, from, from some advocates that, well, you know, drug dealers don't ID. Okay, fine, well, retailers will ID, but does the 21-year-old friend of the 20-year-old who wants marijuana, are they going to ID? No. So social access is going to be a huge issue with this. Um, you're going to have many more social contacts that are going to have access to this drug, which makes it much more easy, it's going to make it much more easier for youth um, to access it. You know, referencing back um, the, the, the talk around um, the criminal element, you know, another thing we have to consider is that right now there are youth who are not exposed to drug dealers, who are not exposed to their criminal element. So under legalization will be exposed to retail marketing. Um, so, you know, that's another thing that we have to think about. So there's, um, I think it's certainly between the messaging, the marketing, um, greater social access. I, I, to me, it's common sense that it's going to be more available. David? Um, I don't think it will for children. I think... Um, you know, the majority of Americans support ending marijuana prohibition, uh, and they care just as much as our youth as everybody uh, else. Um, you know, when you think about marijuana prohibition's stated goals of not having marijuana in our society, it's failed. You know, when you have 80% of high school seniors saying it's easy or, or fairly easy to, to get access to marijuana, then uh, we need to rethink that policy. And, um, you know, Scott mentioned people buying from friends. Yeah, just like uh, we, when we regulate alcohol, you have to be 21 to, to purchase it. And that's not to say that teenagers don't experiment with alcohol. Sure they do. But when they uh, do have to beat, that, that's the, beat the system and break the law, um, they usually have an older brother or older sister or a, a friend who care about them. Whereas a drug dealer, they have other substances to get kids hooked on. They don't care if you're 12 years old or 16 years old. Um, so that's the gateway is that black market. Um, and when we're not honest with our kids about the relative harms of, of these substances, then they're not going to believe authorities um, on other things that they really should. Uh, when, when people say that marijuana is really bad for you and, you know, even to the point that you'll die from it uh, and that kind of hyperbolic, uh, you know, messaging uh, and then kids try it and realize that it is relatively benign, um, then they're not going to believe their parents or authorities when more uh, dangerous situations occur with harder drugs or, um, you know, uh, drinking and driving and things like that. So it's really important that we're honest with our kids because uh, they are smarter than we, we give them credit for and they, they'll definitely appreciate it.
Dad, I can't help but notice your facial expressions a little bit through some of that. Do you have a comment? Um, no, I mean, I just say, you know, yeah, there's going to be older brothers and sisters that, are, that care about their, I don't, anyone who went through college um, knows how it goes. I mean, the, when I turned 21, all of my 20-year-old friends, I became their best friend. Um, the same thing would happen with, with marijuana. There's no reason to expect that that would be any different. So, you know, I, that, that social access problem, again, I think is going to be really huge with, with marijuana if we legalize it. Chief? Absolutely. I, I do think that uh, it will increase uh, usage uh, for youth. And, and let me just draw a simple cop uh, scenario for you. So there's alcohol in the fridge um, in the house that youth lives in. Is that easy to, to get? Is it easier to get than to find a friend to go to a store to do whatever to have access to alcohol? Of course it is. Uh, it, how do most people get started uh, in using uh, prescription drugs or uh, diverting uh, the proper use of prescription medication? Uh, they go to the, the medicine cabinet is where they go. Uh, they don't go to the deep dark corner and get it from some shady drug dealer. Uh, they get it because a doctor uh, gave uh, their parents a hundred oxys uh, for a hangnail uh, and it happens to be sitting in the medicine cabinet and readily available. Um, that's what happens on a day to day basis. Uh, so if we say that it's not going to be any easier, that it's not going to increase with youth uh, when marijuana is in the home. Um, and we're telling uh, society that it's legal uh, and their parents uh, smoke it um, and uh, I don't know what you would do you pour water in the vodka bottle and to even it all out I don't know what you put in uh, a bag of weed that your parents have to equal it all out But if it's in the home, of course, it's going to have uh, easier access to it And of course you're going to have increased usage if I could just follow up really quickly with two statistics um, in Colorado, uh, when the medical system was uh, getting started there for marijuana and regulated, uh, teen use went down two points where nationally it rose two points. And if you look at Maine uh, in a, uh, comparison to New England, Maine has the lowest marijuana use rates for our children uh, compared to the rest of New England, even though uh, Maine has been on the forefront of marijuana policy with you know, having decriminalization the longest and the medical system the longest. So there isn't that correlation. I, I just want to say, I don't, if, another statistic to throw out is I don't think it's an accident that the top states with, with past 30 day use of youth were all medical marijuana states. They're all at the top uh, as far as the highest rates of 30 day usage. I don't think that's an accident. Rodney? Yeah, well, I, I think the high rates um, of youth that have access to marijuana now are a really clear indication of the failure of our criminalization model. Um, I think we're going to obviously see statistics in the future coming out of Washington and Colorado. Um, however, we do have some information from an international context. Um, in 2001, in response to rising drug use rates, Portugal actually passed a law that decriminalized all drug uh, possession. Um, and it's been about 13 years since that law was passed, and um, they've had some really positive outcomes. They've actually seen a significant decrease in um, youth drug, uh, drug use rates, um, particularly from age, youth age 13 to 19. So um, I think that's some really interesting kind of information to consider when we're talking about possible um, impacts of legalization on youth use rates. Before we move on to the next question, Mike, do you want to add to that, Mike Weisinger? Uh, yeah, we've had uh, 108 cases in 15 months of operation, uh, 80 of which have been substance related. And I know of five cases in particular where um, the, in the young person's home was a, a, a member of the family who had a medicinal marijuana card. Um, and it really created additional challenge beyond the um, normal case that we got. And in three of those instances, uh, the young person identified as um, accessing the marijuana they were caught with from their uh, family member who had a medicinal marijuana card. And remember, we're doing restorative justice, and so people are able to talk about their participation, give their perspective, talk about the impact, and it really created some, um, some tenuous moments in these discussions with these families about the young person's perception about marijuana use, how it was impacting their kind of overall development, where they were at, changes that had taken place in that family dynamic, and it really created an additional um, level of difficulty in terms of working through that case. 
Another question from our audience. I'm going to read this to you. I keep hearing the panelists address the criminal justice system, and I'm assuming that the reference there is to incarcerated adults. What about Maine students who won't be able to access federal student loans if they are charged and convicted in a with a marijuana possession or consumption charge? I don't think parents know about this immediate and potentially long-lasting effect on a youth's future success. Chief? Yeah, I think that uh, I'll draw, I guess, two points from, from that comment. I guess the first one is we start talking about prosecutions in the criminal justice system. Uh, let's be very clear in the state of Maine of what we're talking about here. Uh, today, we talk about decriminalization in the state of Maine. Up to two and a half ounces of marijuana is a civil offense. Uh, so if there's any misconception that uh, you have a joint in your pocket, you're going to prison, um, that's not the truth. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, it couldn't happen. Uh, for possession of less than two and a half ounces of marijuana. So I, I definitely want to make sure that that's clear. There was a lot of, of back and forth around the, the city of Portland ordinance uh, in reference to that. I will also say that uh, when we start talking about student loans as an example, if that's having a negative impact on our youth, then again, do we legalize marijuana? Or as a society, do we decide we're going to address that one particular issue and say, well, maybe uh, we shouldn't uh, ban student loans uh, because you were 16 years old and you had a joint. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me to, to have a system and just say, all right, well, it's definitely a valid point here. Let's just legalize it. Let's just throw in the towel. We're going to legalize the whole thing uh, because we did have a negative impact there. Because there are negative impacts uh, without question. Um, too many. Uh, pieces of legislation. Certainly, uh, in that particular instance, we're talking about youth. Uh, we're talking about their futures. Uh, you know, nobody wants uh, somebody's future to be scarred or uh, hampered in any way um, by youthful uh, indiscretion. Uh, but again, I don't think we should just say, all right, well, let's just legalize it then and call it a day. Uh, no, you wanted to mention something? I, I just want to kind of echo that and want to make clear that this is actually one thing, one of Sam Means' four, four pillars. We, we, we agree. We don't think uh, a uh, one choice that a youth makes should scar them for the rest of their lives. We agree. So we, but the thing, and, and just like the chief said, you don't need to legalize marijuana to fix that problem. You can fix it. We can start talking about fixing that problem now. We don't need to wait till 2016 to legalize it in Maine to start addressing that problem. So let's let's start talking about. It. Let's see how we how we can address that. Um, but but totally agree. I, I I don't. We we don't believe that that should should follow a student around uh, for the rest of their life. But but legalization really isn't the answer to that issue. Grania, do you want to say something? Can I just address that really quickly? Um, I think with, in regards specifically to federal student aid, even just a citation um, could potentially uh, cost someone their federal student aid. Um, so when we're talking about just issuing a citation for, possess for an adult possessing up to 2.5 ounces, that can have real life consequences. Um, so, um, yeah. Oh, do you have a question? Step right up. Clarify with financial aid then, because it's come up a lot with Maine SAMs, is that it only affects your financial aid if the offense is while you're already receiving financial aid. So if a student was charged with possession of a joint in high school or even outside of a time that they were receiving financial aid, it will have no impact on their financial aid ever. David or Mike, do you want to comment on this one, or do you want me to move on to another question? Um, on sure. The ample time. I, I think, you know, kids, you know, often make mistakes and those types of punishments uh, are counterproductive. Uh, you know, our last three presidents all admitted to using marijuana and they're president now. And yet we have kids, um, especially the urban youth, that get a marijuana, gets a marijuana charge and it follows them the rest of their, their life. And yes, Maine is decriminalized, but there's lots of states that aren't decriminalized, that carry very harsh penalties. Um, some people are actually in jail for the, their life for, for marijuana offense, for just possession. And that's ridiculous, that is crazy. Um, so I, I do think um, we as neighbors to other states that have harsher penalties have uh, a moral imperative to do the right thing and be the example for the rest of the country. Mike, do you want to comment before I Nope, you're all set. All right, let me get to this next question. We're at about 20 minutes, so I want to kind of move on here. Uh, internet, I'm sure everybody knows this and seen it, washed with marijuana products such as pot tart, pot soda, 
uh, candy of all types. These types of products clearly attractive to the youth. So some of these products almost impossible to tell apart from actual candy that kids could get at their local store. So what can we do to make sure that these do not find their way into our kids' hands? You know, how can we prevent these products from being marketed in Maine? David? Um, yeah. I think we can, uh, we have the opportunity, um, given that this is a new industry, to we have the opportunity to create responsible regulations right off the bat. Um, there can be broad rules covering advertising, labeling, testing, serving sizes, additives, um, you know, how we advertise, where you can advertise, what type of advertisements you can do. Um, you know, the tobacco industry was initially poorly regulated, and we know about Joe Camel and the tobacco scientists uh, that say tobacco is safe. Um, and there was, you know, not very much public knowledge about the health effects of tobacco as we currently have for marijuana. Um, so I would argue that, you know, we have the opportunity to make sure it's done right. It doesn't make sense that we would want marijuana to be sold by criminals instead of licensed businesses. You can see behind you there's some pictures of what we were describing earlier. Scott, do you want to comment on this? Um, well, tobacco and alcohol companies still develop and market products that appeal to youth. So um, if we're going to look at that as a potential success for marijuana, I would argue you know, one way we can prevent this from happening is not allowing it to happen in Maine. Um, if we allow a big marijuana corporate cannabis to set up in Maine, I mean, this is what they're going to bring to Maine. Um, you know, the, the regulation, if, if we were to legalize marijuana in Maine, the regulations we get upon a bill passing or referendum passing, those would be the best regulations we'd ever get. Um, a lobbyist, lobbyists would come in and strip it away. I mean, it's just as they do with alcohol and tobacco. They, a lot of prevention efforts, a lot of prevention initiatives are fought very hardly by well-paid lobbyists. Uh, so, you know, the best scenario we could ever get is when it passed and then it would quickly be eroded away. So I think the best way to prevent it is just prevent, it, prevent, prevent them from, from setting up in Maine and not legalizing. Rania? Uh, I think setting up a regulatory framework is not really within the focus of my organization's mission. Um, but I do think we spend so much money enforcing marijuana laws under this criminalization model. And in 2010, Maine spent almost $9 million just enforcing marijuana possession laws. So I think that's a lot of resources that could be better directed into education programs um, that educate around concerns around marijuana use. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Chief, I want to get to you next. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I sure do. Uh, I would agree, uh, you know, with Scott. When we just say, okay, that's simply. I think we can sit here and say, do we think this is the right way to do business? Uh, should our youth walk into a 7-Eleven? No matter what happens with marijuana uh, legislation, it's legalized tomorrow across the state. Do we think this is a good idea? Um, and I think let's throw a referendum out there for that and take a simple vote to say that that's ludicrous uh, that they have access to that. From a legislative standpoint, uh, you can look at synthetic uh, cannabinoids when you're talking about the spice um, and how you could walk into a 7-Eleven and get uh, spice off the rack uh, until that was uh, made illegal uh, in the state of Maine. Now, it's the same thing. Uh, we have a lot of issues around uh, meth and the precursors to that and how do we uh, really try to regulate something where they change one chemical formula and all of a sudden now that's legal and this other one's not. But I think we can uh, come to agreement across the board on things like this. It speaks for itself. Um, this one slide is the entire campaign against, uh, against allowing this to happen, period. Uh, you're going to regulate it, just ban it. Mike? I struggle with um, this issue um, in particular. I, I don't drink, but I am privy to the advertisements. Like, I think there's a Smirnoff marshmallow, and I mean, I don't know the adults that are drinking these things, but I'm, I have a, a sneaking suspicion that's not necessarily their target audience. And so, I mean, I think that if there was some good policy in place for responsible adults targeted at moderate use, there could be some um, checks and balances and some safety protocols to ensure that these things don't fall into the hands of youth, um, but... An audience, a question from the audience? I, uh, I want to ask uh, the panel 
Um, we all agree that tobacco and alcohol are harmful. Um, uh, they have, uh, you know, health consequences. Um, and marijuana does have long-term um, consequences as well, but it seems to me that they are largely a uh, product of our legal system. And I'm wondering what are the long-term consequences of marijuana that we're pr trying to protect people from? And um, if those are simply uh, health effects, do, do the anti-legalization panelists also support the ban of cigarettes and alcohol? Thank you. Chief, do you want to take this? I know you already mentioned the ban on cigarettes, but if you want to go ahead and kind of repeat that a little bit. Or alcohol, rather. There's a lot in there, so I, uh, I apologize. This is a great question. Uh, I, I do think uh, the various aspects of that question have been, have been answered uh, a few different ways up here so far tonight. Uh, but I guess uh, what I would say is that uh, there are a multitude of negative aspects uh, of marijuana, certainly health uh, being one of them. Uh, we're talking about here tonight, we're talking about youth access. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, and when we focus on that and you talk about the behavioral health issues, uh, the uh, IQ issues that are involved, uh, and any... Let me go back to tobacco versus marijuana. So now we're saying that uh, from, from a marijuana standpoint, even a medical marijuana standpoint, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes. But it's okay if you smoke medical marijuana. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. As a, as, a, as a kid from a small town in Franklin County, just using a simple common sense filter, uh, if, if somehow this is determined, uh, the long-term positive effects of that, uh, you know, from a medical marijuana standpoint, or that, hey, this doesn't bother you at all, we should just legalize it, you would think uh, that they would study this to the point that we wouldn't be smoking it. Because um, if you're smoking it, it's having a negative impact on your body. And again, I think if I go back to alcohol and tobacco, and we say, well, just because uh, we're already doing those things, we should do this. And, and that's not the case. That's not the case in my book. I think you learn um, and you realize uh, that if, uh, if I could snap my fingers today and get rid of alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, I'd be out of a job. And that'd be okay with me, because it would positively impact the community um, you know, in, in, in ways we would never imagine. Uh, and so that's not going to happen. Alcohol is here, it's legal. Uh, tobacco is here, and it's legal, and we regulate that to the best of our ability. Uh, but even in those cases, it's poorly done, because it has negative impacts across the board on everybody especially youth, again, which is why we're here tonight. Uh, David, you were shaking your head? I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize if I missed a bunch. But. Yeah, I, I don't think that if alcohol was banned, that would be better for our society because we tried that uh, with alcohol prohibition, and it didn't work. It turned millions of adults who are otherwise law-abiding citizens into criminals, and with that came violence. Uh, Al Capone uh, was a gangster, and but he, he, was, he was giving people alcohol, what they wanted. And instead of having marijuana sold by Al Capones, uh, marijuana should be sold by licensed, regulated, tax-paying businesses. Right now, all that money is being flushed down the toilet and going to drug cartels and drug dealers rather than our state. Uh, money that the state needs so we could uh, spend money to, uh, for our substance abuse programs. So we could spend money um, having PSAs, telling people not to use marijuana uh, and drive. Uh, so, and I think we would have a healthier society if uh, marijuana was legal and you know, if half the people who drank alcohol every day chose to use marijuana, we'd have a healthier society. There's no doubt about that. Scott, your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the chief addressed well the, 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 the question about uh, tobacco, and, uh, tobacco and alcohol. I think we certainly need to do a better job of regu regulating it. The reality is what it is. Um, you know, we're, no matter how much I would want to, I'm not saying that I do, we're never going back there. Although I would posit that I think, you know, when, when people were considering 50, 60 years ago these questions, if they knew today, what we, if they knew about alcohol and tobacco today, or we know, I'm just trying to hard time saying this, what we know about it today then, you know, the outcome may have been different. I mean, we have better science. We have the science now on marijuana, so there's no excuse. We know the impacts. I mean, if you want to know the health impacts, there's this hand out on the table developed by the state that well outlines the impacts on youth. So I mean, the science is clear on the impacts of marijuana. Um, so um, and again, just I think if the chief said, just because we're having issues with these two, it doesn't make sense to make another issue. Um, so. Rania? 
Yeah, again, I, I don't feel that I can weigh in on the relative safety of alcohol versus tobacco versus marijuana. Um, but I think what we have seen um, with tobacco is successes in using education as a way um, to prevent use, use rates. Um, I was looking at something from Maine Healthy Partnerships, and um, high school age smoking in Maine dropped by 43% in the decade from 1999 to 2009. And that occurred not because we were locking people up or punishing people for smoking cigarettes. That's, that occurred because we were investing in education programs to educate youth about potential harms around smoking cigarettes. So, Mike, do you want to make a comment? Or ready to move on? Yeah, ready to move on. Ready to move on. All right. We are nearing the. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, absolutely. Do you want to get up to the mic or do you want to. Whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, my name is Jim Moses. I'm a school administrator here in Portland. And um, we just got on the conversation with the kind of the different messages we're sending. I'm getting a little confused with the conversation because a lot of it's about adults. And I thought the title of this was about youth. Um, I would say that um, I'm getting on in years. And uh, in my 40 years in education, we've had this conversation many times going back 40 years in gymnasiums and auditoriums about marijuana use. Being a child of uh, coming of age in the 60s, uh, when came out of the shadows and talked about, and yet we still are, with the issues we face. In my role as school administrator, uh, which I had not seen before in my years in the classroom so much, uh, more oblivious to it, is the um, damage that heavy marijuana use is doing to a percentage of high school students. Um, these are the kids that aren't performing. These are the kids that don't go to the classes. Um, these are the kids that have low self-esteem. Um, these are the kids that are high every day, all day. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't, I don't want the legal stuff. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, Prohibition didn't work. Um, we know that putting kids in prison for life for marijuana isn't going to work. Um, and you're right about cigarette smoking. I think education over the long term has done a wonderful thing. So I don't know where I stand on the legal issue, but I'm just telling you, day to day, the damage that is, these kids are doing. And legalized or not, and I'm not sure, um, I can score you, score you a bag of pot in about 15 seconds tomorrow morning um, with my contacts. So, uh, and the other thing, David, that I could say is I, I appreciate your comment about the last three presidents. That might answer a lot of questions. But it's problematically, it's not um, hard to know. But if we're going to talk about you, I'm just telling you from a guy who deals with it every single day, um, as do the police and our SRO and my high school, it's a problem. It's a problem for probably the heavy users in a small percentage. It's going to have huge impacts. And uh, um, I just like to keep the conversation around what are we going to do. Um, I, I think we're probably right. It's going to be legalized in this country and every state eventually at some point in time. Um, education is the key, but I just don't have, I just, I see it and it's, it's problematic for me. And if we can stay focused on what we do about that, I think we can find it. Thank you. And we talked about that as far as the accessibility for the youth. You know, and I'm not sure you know, if, you, if you heard the answer to that, but many of them on the panel were saying that it would be more accessible to them. Not all of them feel that way. But if that's the case, then you know, Chief, I don't know if you want to address that, or Ganya, or Scott, or anybody. <laughs> I'm sorry, which part of that? Oh, I'm sorry, just the part about being more accessible, um, if it's legalized for kids. I think that uh, there's no question in my mind that it would be more accessible if it's if it's legalized, um, and how that impacts you know our youth in the negative manner. Uh, I believe it impacts our youth, um, and uh, having regular conversations with our SROs, uh, and uh, one of them just recently, uh, you know, writing uh, to us around the hallways reeking of marijuana all day, um, in a learning environment uh, where they're there uh, in that. Uh, even the, you know, from a from a scientific medical standpoint, they're in that zone. They're in that problematic area around brain development, and and, and yet they're high. And again, the common sense approach says, is that going to have a negative impact on their future? Of course it is. Uh, of course it is. So I certainly appreciate your comment. Uh, 
Scott, you want to say uh, something? I, I kind of want to make three quick points. First, I want to ad address sort of the last point you made about the inevitability. I would challenge that. I, I don't think it necessarily is inevitable. We have quite a bit to learn from Colorado and Washington. So um, I'm, I'm, I don't believe that that ship has sailed quite yet. Um, the second point I would make is that the state did a great um, report on the main integrated youth health survey and looking at grades, and I think it illustrates what you said. If you look at, and this is common with many substances, but it's, it's, it's true with marijuana. If you look at the students that are getting Ds and Fs, a large percentage, a larger percentage of them are using marijuana compared to the students that are getting As and Bs. So if, if you wanna, if anybody's interested in getting that report, I can hook you up, let me know. Um, and then the, the final point, I, again, talking about, um, and we'll kind of go back to something that was mentioned before about this, this idea of substitution, that we should steer people towards alcohol or marijuana. I mean, the reality is that that may happen with casual users. A casual user may choose marijuana over, over uh, alcohol or the other. That's not the case with people who are addicted. That's not the case with people who are heavy users. They're using both. I mean, my law enforcement partners where I work in Andrews Goggin County would tell me when they bus parties, underage drinking parties, they're both there, marijuana and alcohol. They're using both. I mean, anyone who went through college, I went through college, they were both there. People were drinking and using marijuana. This idea that it's a substitute, again, for a casual user, sure, that may be the case. But for the heavy users that are consuming most of the product, not so much. David, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I appreciate your comments, sir. And uh, everyone on this panel agrees that we don't want our youth to use marijuana or other mind-altering substances, especially when their brain is uh, very, um, exposed and um, can, can hurt that. And, but it's tough to talk about the solution without talking about regulating marijuana um, because we've tried not regulating it and it hasn't worked obviously by the statistics we all have, have quoted. Um, but like Grania said, in the 90s uh, with the WeCard program uh, with tobacco use, uh, tobacco use went down in the 90s and has gone down. And, you know, research shows that uh, reforming marijuana laws does not increase teen marijuana use. A 2012 study of uh, researchers at University of Colorado, Montana, and Oregon found, quote, no statistical evidence that legalization increases the probability of teen use and noted that the data often showed a negative relationship between legalization and teen marijuana use. Uh, state surveys of students in several states with medical marijuana laws have consistently reported declines in teen marijuana use since those laws were uh, passed. Uh, so, in, in surmise, regulation does work. Right, we're going to get to our last two questions at this point. We want to wrap up the evening with these, and I'm going to ask each of you on our panel. You've all stated there is a unique risk for youth who use marijuana, and we as adults and leaders in the community are all responsible for creating an environment which supports the drug-free development of our youth. So the question is, what do you see as your role in creating such an environment? Mike, do you want to go first? Not the chief, Mike, the other Mike. Uh, yeah, um, there are lots of opportunities. Um, getting involved in a local coalition, um, we rely heavily on volunteers as do uh, many of the healthy community partnerships and drug-free community partnerships that we work with. Um, and just be active and involved in young people's lives. Um, you know, I'm hesitant to draw a correlation between those kids who are really doing poorly in school and uh, marijuana use, but I know Jim and I have both seen um, the change over time in a young person that takes place after the marijuana use begins. And those are of most concern for me because I think there's a lot of other factors in some of those youth you've cited. Keith? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, you know, engagement, uh, I think you're going to hear that over and over again. Uh, I think education, I think uh, keeping an open mind to the conversation. Be, the key to me is to be part of the conversation. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, sex education, we talk about alcohol, are we having the same conversations with our youth around marijuana? Um, I, I'm not sure uh, what our grade would be as a panel as far as trying to stay focused on youth. I, I would agree with you, Jim. I found myself, uh, you know, wading towards uh, the legalization kind of debate uh, myself. But I, I think when you have a panel like this, and just read the fancy little titles under and the organizations under each of these, we can stand together and say consistently uh, and have kept coming back to that, that nobody up here is for youth 
uh, of youth's access um, and to marijuana. And I think we need to be consistent on that. We need to be strong on that line, if no other line, um, than that line. Uh, and, and make sure that that's in the forefront of our, of our conversations. Ronio, your thoughts on that? Yeah, we the ACLU of Maine really sees that our role in this whole conversation is reducing uh, the use of the criminal justice system to try and address marijuana use among adults and, and youth. Um, we really believe that we need to be shifting our response from a criminal response, criminal justice response to more of a public health um, response that advocates health-based solutions and uh, directs resources away from enforcing laws and into education programs. Um, so that's really, I think, where we see our role in this conversation. David? I think um, my role and everyone's role should be having an open dialogue with our children, with the youth, so that they feel comfortable to come and talk to adults about what's going on uh, at school um, or around the neighborhood and being honest with them about the relative harms of these substances and other substances. Um, you know, again, when young people realize that marijuana is not as dangerous as they've been led to believe, they are less likely to trust authorities' warnings about other uh, very more dangerous drugs. Uh, so, you know, my role um, will be to advocate for a system that regulates marijuana like alcohol because the statistics uh, do back it up that regulation works, setting that check uh, will make children's use go down. And I think that's why we're all here tonight, obviously. Scott? Um, so, you know, as I stated at the opening, you know, Sam Main does have, have a stance on the legalization question, which, which I think is probably pretty clear now. Um, but, you know, but really, one of our main goals is, actually our first goal is to inform Mainers and Maine policy with the science of today's marijuana. That's our main goal. Is we just, you know, ultimately we know that, that adults are going to have different opinions on, on this, this policy question. But no matter what their opinion is, they should be armed with the facts and particularly with our youth. I think it's important that no matter where an adult fa falls on, the, on that, that policy question, it is important that they're sharing valid science and information with their children. I mean, it is important. I mean, kids have access to the internet. They can Google and look, look for all kinds of different information. So it, is, it, is, it is important that you know, we're upfront with our youth. And I think that the chief is right. You know, just that constant communication and conversation is huge. Um, it's, it's a huge protective factor for youth to know that adults value their opinion that will li and will listen to them. Um, and so we think that's our role is to help providing the, the information to guide those conversations. Very much. On behalf of 21 Reasons and the City of Portland, our panelists, thank you so much for being here and having this important conversation tonight. For a rebroadcast of this show, check the CTN5 listings for more information on tonight's hosts and panelists. You can be found, they can be found on 21 Reasons website. That's www.21reasons.org, as well as the City of Portland's public health website. That is www.portlandmaine.org. Dot gov. As a reminder, the views expressed this evening are those of our panelists and not necessarily our hosts. So thank you all for being here tonight and sharing in this important conversation and a big round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.